Lord Robertson, who's just left, uh, told me early on that one of the reasons why he wanted to stay with this program was because we had mainstreamed student and generation Y engagement throughout the program. And I just would like to emphasize that that was not tokenism, that was not trying to tick a box and be politically correct in this day and age. It's because I passionately believe that this inter intergenerational dialogue uh, and, re and improved relationship is absolutely pivotal. And frankly, what I have seen, whether it's the science panels, whether it's LSE, whether it's King's College, the Next Generation Leadership Panel has reinforced that in me and I'm determined that as this program moves ahead, we will further increase the, uh, the dialogues that we're having. One idea that we've got, the under 35s from Chatham House, Rusi, the students from LSE, King's College, we will do joint events together. And you guys are going to come up with your own better ideas how we can do that to take it forward. So with no further ado, I'm going to hand over with great thanks to Manveen Rana, who's editor at World at One and PM Programme for, for moderating this panel, and to all you panellists for giving your time, and I really look forward to what you're going to say. Thank you. Thanks to everyone who's still here and hasn't run down the corridor after Lord Robertson. Um, that was a, a stellar panel to follow, um, but I'm glad to say that we're joined by some of the next generation's brightest and best, um, the people here are the people we hope will be the next round of leaders. Um, it's a huge panel <laughs> compared to the last. So I'm just going to ask if we sort of work around for everyone to introduce themselves, but also just so that you can get an idea of the scale uh, of, this, of this operation, just to, to tell you a little bit about the, the individual panels that they've been on um, and what they've, they've learned from them. So if we start with... Matt at the end. I'm uh, Matthew Smith. I am a joint master's candidate and Fulbright scholar at the University of Warwick uh, in Coventry and also uh, Universitat uh, Pompeo Fabra in Barcelona. And I, I came up here specifically for this, so I uh, thought I'd uh, uh, catch a flight over here to, to cold England. But um, I, I worked on the um, Democracy in the Digital Age uh, panel. And uh, that's it, it was it was a great experience. Got to work with some 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 great scholars and great uh, professionals. So it's it's been a great experience so far. Hello, my name is Lily Matthews. Um, I had the honour of working on the Next Generation Leaders Panel um, along with Learn to Lead. Um, I am currently studying for a postgraduate certificate in fresh food and produce management, um, whilst also doing two years of secondments within. Um, prominent food companies and I'm looking to potentially move into that industry afterwards. The Next Generation Leaders Panel um, for me was very, very important because it combines so many different elements of leadership and actually consolidated that for me. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, my name is Ben Ryan and uh, I am not a student uh, anymore. Uh, I'm a researcher at Theos, which is a religion and society think tank, and I worked uh, on the faith and religion panel, trying to look at the challenges that faith and religion continue to pose in the modern world, and perhaps even increasingly pose in the 21st century. Hi, uh, I'm James Everson. Uh, I'm, so I'm another one of the Churchill Next Generation Leadership Fellows. Um, I'm also a fifth year medical student at UCL. Um, and in most of my spare time, um, I'm part of something called the University of London Officer Training Corps, which is uh, a student organisation, but it's part of the Army Reserve. And I have aspirations to go into the Army Reserve in the future. Um, I think what's un unique about the Churchill Leadership Programme for me is the fact that it's very easy for sort of programmes like this and lectures on leadership become very academic and it becomes reading off PowerPoint slides and that sort of thing. Whereas what's unique about this program is that actually you're surrounded by people who are genuinely inspiring leaders. And so for us as potential next generation leaders, it's not about learning the theory and understanding leadership. It's actually just about seeing good leaders and seeing how they work and learning from that experience and being able to bounce off that, which actually I think is the most valuable. And that's the sort of thing that can so easily be integrated throughout the whole education system and so on, because actually, you know, there are an abundance of inspiring leaders out there and they do come in all shapes and sizes, whether that's 
sort of prime ministers, military generals, that sort of thing, right down to your local community people, your, your teachers in schools, that sort of thing. Um, and I just think that's really easy to be overlooked, but actually is, is a really good way of integrating leadership. Good morning, I'm Georgia Snyder. Um, I am one of the Churchill uh, Next Generation Leadership Fellows as well. Um, I'm currently in my second year of studying theology at Durham University, um, and the majority of my time is currently spent doing interfaith work. Um, I've set up recently a scriptural reasoning group at Durham, um, which um, tries to teach um, people how to engage with um, others who have very different opinions to themselves. Um, so part of being um, part of the Learn to Lead program um, has enabled us to have an opportunity to contribute to the education um, report. Um, and for me, that's, that's been huge, to be able to be surrounded by people who um, have such a genuine desire to raise the next generation. Um, and especially with um, faith interests, I think it's, it's, a, it's a challenge to get into the education curriculum, this idea of very authentic relationships from a young age um, and learning to deal not just with how can we accommodate um, X and Y within a, within a community, but actually how can we accommodate X and then not X, um, which presents a, a much uh, stronger challenge for them building authentic relationships. Hi, I'm Emmeline Carr. Um, I'm one of the students on the panel from King's College London. Um, the King's panel was a little bit different. We focused on conflict and instability in the 21st century, but we were lucky enough to have 10 students and then five mentors um, who guided us through the process, were there for us to bounce ideas off, looked over our reports um, and other things like that. And that, for me, has been the best part of this project. We were just discussing with our mentor how wonderful it's been to have, um, to really bridge the divide between the current leaders and hopefully the next generation of leaders are actually being able to be in the same room and have these conversations. It's been such a wonderful experience for us and we hope that we are throwing some new ideas out there as well and contributing um, too. So that's been the best part of the project for me. Hello, I'm Shreya Das, soon to be graduate seeking gainful employment. And um, pending exam results, I've just finished an MSc in the history of international relations at LSE. Uh, and we, uh, undertook a panel where we tackled the, the rather interesting question of power and the changing nature of power in the 21st century and what that means for statesmen. Hello, uh, my name is Aurélie Bertart. Um, also at King's, I was uh, in the same panel as Emmeline. And if I had to talk about the experience, I would probably repeat the same uh, as she did. Um, I'm uh, studying international relations and specializing in the European Union and the international system. And I worked on uh, the propaganda environment of the 21st century and how leaders can face it. Hi, <clears throat> I'm Ollie, and I feel like I've overstayed my welcome. Um, sorry, uh, so uh, I'm, uh, so I, I work at a company called Decoded. Um, I guess hopefully maybe the perspective that I can bring is we work a lot with older generation leaders uh, that are trying to get in touch with the youth. Um, so, uh, uh, so yeah, so I think that, that that challenge of bridging the gap, you know, how is it, uh, as I think there was a really great um, quote from uh, the business and finance report from a younger generation leader, which was, you know, how can leadership not just be World Bank speak? I think was a really great shorthand for actually, um, you know, how do you how do you kind of um, speak in an engaging way and actually have meaningful leadership both from from young and old people at the same time. Uh, hello, my name is James Dolan from uh, the Cambridge University Science and Policy Exchange, uh, and I was peripherally involved in the report "Statesmanship in a Scientific Age." Uh, the Cambridge University Science and Policy Exchange is an organisation run by and for early career researchers who are interested in how their science and evidence can feed into the policy making process. So I'm perhaps not so much a next generation leader, but a next generation advisor, perhaps as uh, a PhD student myself in say engineering and physics at the moment. James, if you hang on to the mic, just before we do open it out to, to the floor, I just wanted, so we get a little snapshot of where this generation is, working around, regardless of which panel you were in, what do you see as the biggest fear, the biggest danger, the biggest challenge to your generation when it comes to when you'll be hopefully leading it? Um, I think that's very difficult. I think, um, I think the, biggest, the biggest challenge is the fact that we often don't know what the challenges are. 
perfectly. We don't know what the implications of the solutions of the challenges might be. We've some, to some extent forgotten what previous challenges were and how we solved them. And so this is why I think science is particularly important in this area because it provides both foresight and I'd argue hindsight because I mean science not only as the natural sciences, I mean the social sciences, the arts, and the humanities. And so I think we have a huge amount of knowledge and evidence, and I think to a great extent, the risk is not capitalizing on that and um, entering into various policy decisions with, let's say, one eye closed. Um, I, I'd say uh, answering the question what it is to be human, I think what... Um, technology and um, kind of the openness of media, et cetera, is doing is uh, changing what the purpose of existence is. If you don't have to work, uh, if you, uh, it's actually cheaper for you, for a government, for you not to work and just to sit at home all day. Um, if you uh, kind of are living in a different country and uh, you see how other people are living and you feel like you should be entitled to that, I think we've always had a very nice explanation of why those people shouldn't be entitled to the same things we are because they happen to be across the other side of the world. The minute they're not, I think that questions why, why us and not them. Um, and so I think that, that answering those questions in a uh, not a dogmatic way, genuinely engaging with it, um, I think is a really, really difficult challenge because I think it completely reconceptualizes all of the things that we've held true for kind of most of human history. Um, I think I'd say it's acting um, both ethically and effectively in a, a world where there's an undeniable rise of the individual, where, whether it's uh, well underway or not, um, because statesmanship is um, is going to have to be uh, is going to be probably very impacted by this um, rise of the individual that is technically um, um, developed um, and yeah it's it's still very vague how statesmen will fit into the, this picture. Uh, I'm going to take a classic LSE abstract world at large view of this. I think the main problem we're facing now is the decentralization and diffusion of power. So you, you leaders can't just sit in a group, you know, concert of Europe style, small group decision making. Power isn't just set, focused in one locus in the world anymore. It's becoming um, spread out over many states. And so you need a much more multilateral approach to, to reach a consensus than you perhaps did in the past. And tying into that is the diffusion of power where uh, you have non-state entities like Daesh coming up and becoming much more powerful than some states. And they're not constrained in the same way that states are, for example, in the use of force and in the, in the way they use violence to achieve their aims. So I think um, dealing with those things in a creative and nuanced way is going to be uh, the main challenge facing leaders of tomorrow. Um, so the one thing that I has been bringing, the one word that's been ringing in my brain through the whole previous panel and this panel is education. It's all well and good, us sitting here today and discussing these issues as potentially the next generation of leaders, but there are hundreds and thousands of other potential next generation leaders out there. Whether that's educa educating that next generation, whether it's educating the millions who don't have access to education, but also ac uh, educating the public and the general population about these issues. You'd be surprised, well, you probably experienced this a lot, about the number of people who do not truly understand the global issues that we're facing. They might understand domestic politics because it affects them, but in reality, they only understand the things that affect them. So I think education is the thing that underlies everything that has been said this morning and that will continue to be said today. I can say there's probably a role for the media there. Um, I think a lot of the um, work that I do in Durham is working with young kids out on the street who um, most of them have been kicked out of school. Um, they have absolutely no aspirations to achieve because they've been told that they have, they're useless um, and because they can't survive in the education system. Um, they're now out trying to uh, make their living some other way, not in the best way in most of cases. Um, but so many of them have unbelievable leadership potential and if only that could be cultivated. And um, I think the issue is what I see um, in the way that they communicate with one another is... Um, these, these kind of clans almost that come together, they, they have an amazing on the streets, these groups um, and this sense of identity, um, but a, a real struggle to then understand other people. And I think, um, especially with um, social media and young kids from such a young age being behind screens and able to hide behind that, um, I think the greatest challenge that we have is actually just the ability to communicate. Um, and I think, 
I'm seeing it more and more in, in younger and younger generations where there's no, um, there's no one to actually tell them, okay, this is how you have a conversation and this is how you engage with, with people who are different to you. Um, and especially in a culture that then says, is trying to teach a moral of, okay, you need to respect what other people believe and respect what other, the way that other people live. Actually, this whole, okay, I live the way I live, you live the way you live, instead of simply being something that's then getting everyone living well together, it's, it's um, encouraging an attitude I, in what I see to say, I'm going to do what I'm going to do, and if you're going to do what you can do, and if it gets in my way, then that's a problem. Um, and so I think we're setting ourselves up for a big issue. <laughs> um, so I think my, my main concern relates to actually the idea that leadership is something that can be developed and can be trained, and there are certain skills which you know, are part of leadership, which is good communication skills, being able to demonstrate empathy, being able to understand the people you're working with. And my concern is that we're going to have a next generation of leaders getting into leadership positions where actually they don't have an understanding of how to be a leader or what it is to be a leader because not, they've not been trained in it. They've not developed skills to be a leader. And actually, I think if we look at a lot of leaders, you get into a leadership position, but when have you actually had training or had that developed within you? And actually, it doesn't happen very often. Um, and so I think actually it's very encouraging to see things like this next generation leadership program put together. And if we look at different organizations, there's a bigger push towards actually developing leadership training programs and mentorship, um, which I think is actually really important. But I just worry that we're still going to have lots of people coming into leadership roles when actually they're not qualified or trained to do it. Because actually, you know, we wouldn't accept if we had someone a doctor treating us who wasn't trained. So why do we accept having people leading us in society, people being leaders, if they've not been trained and had that experience to be a leader? I think, hands down, the biggest challenge we're all facing is how to get round questions like, what is the challenge? Uh, I think it's a damning indictment of the way we've all come to view leadership, that it's about risk management. Uh, and everything that we've heard today has been about how we have to do something to avoid this problem, or we have to do something, or there'll be climate change, or plagues, and... No, I don't want to talk about that. I think uh, the challenge for leadership is to be positive. It is to actually provide hope and a way forwards, so that on an issue like religion, I don't want to talk to you about ISIS and Islamic radicalization and how we stop kids from Bradford ending up going to Syria. I want to talk to you about how we use religion as a constituent part of people's identities so that they can flourish and so we can create the best society that we actually can. And the challenge for leadership is to do that and to stop thinking about, oh my goodness, what's going to happen next? How do we stop it? I think the words leader and leadership have been thrown around on both panels this morning quite a lot. But it's quite easy to pick out and focus on one leader as being the centre and what everyone's aiming for. And it was mentioned before, what do you think is going, who do you think is going to be the future leader in 10 years' time? But I don't think that's what we should be looking for. I think that we should be looking for what will make a good leader in 10 years' time, what will be the values that that leader will have, what will be the standards that that leader will strive for within their life. And I think that is something that we should be looking at in, fu in the future in order to generate leadership rather than generating leaders in a position without the ability to hold leadership. You know, this, is, this has been an interesting process for me and I think I've, I've found myself in this position again of being the only American in a, in a room full of, full of Brits. Uh, but, you know, being kind of the... Uh, anti-elitist, iconoclastic, tea-throwing American that I am. Uh, it was it was a little bit difficult for me to to pair the ideas of statementship and democracy, and participatory democracy in particular, which is what my field is. Uh, and I, I I did sort of a mini literature review of of going back to the 1800s, talking about statesmanship. And uh, uh, the first thing that I found, it was lives of the most eminent foreign statesmen. And it was, it was names like Lorenzo de' Medici and, and Cardinal Richelieu, not people that we necessarily 
associate with democracy. Uh, and and you have you have uh, people like Leonard D. White, who is familiar with with sort of Churchill and Roosevelt's brand of statesmanship. He worked in the Roosevelt administration in in the U.S. and he he talked about the decay of statesmanship and and connected it with the the decay of administration by gentlemen and the the decline of kind of the English gentry uh, in in the early United States. And and you have you have several of these authors that have kind of this this very uh, I, I don't know elitist elitist uh, kind of almost paternal view of of statesmanship, uh, but then there was there was one that stuck out to me, which was J. Rufus Fears, uh, and he he defined statesmanship as uh, having having bedrock principles, a moral compass, a vision, and an ability to build consensus, and that's the definition that I think is is most compatible with uh, kind of the democratic process from from my perspective and as far as the challenge uh, when you're talking about a vision I think the the challenge for a democratic statesman or stateswoman in in the 21st century is empowering the rest of society to lead and and to to take it upon themselves to solve a lot of these problems that we're talking about uh, and and we've we've heard from the last panel uh, talk of local leaders and and empowering students and I think that's one of one of the things that we have to really focus on is is how can we diffuse this this leadership down to the local level and down to uh, a more participatory form of leadership and and statesmanship. It's not often you get here in America aligning the death of statesmanship with the death of the English gentry. <laughs> Um, are there any questions from the floor at this stage? I wonder, could the panel talk about money? <clears throat> I mean, think, look, looking at the whole range of things you talked about, I mean, Shreya, for example, decentralization of power, what about the centralization of money globally, you know, you know and the, the, the power of the wealthy? American democracy, is it not plutocracy? You know, <clears throat> you know, you just look at practically everything that you've talked about has money involved in it. How do you see, as the next generation leaders, how do you see yourself leading in relation to money? No, this is this is something that I'm I'm very concerned about is is the growing inequality. A lot of people talk about this, and, and everyone talks about it. It's you know from from the Economist to to uh, Jacobin magazine, and you know every every uh, position in the in the ideological spectrum talks about this growing inequality. And a lot of people talk about it in economic terms that you know it's it's inhibiting growth. It's it's uh, you know, creating you know an economic underclass, all all these kind of things. But from my my perspective, from the democratic perspective, um, there's a more I, I don't know fundamental issue of political equality that follows from the economic inequality. And I think for for the next the next generation, if we're if we're going to have a politically equal society, we do have to deal with the growing economic inequality in and of itself, not just as an economic issue, but as a, a, an issue of, of political equality and democracy. Because we cannot have, there's, a, there's a, uh, an American jurist, Supreme Court justice uh, from, from the early 20th century, uh, Woodrow Wilson appointee, who said we have a choice to make in this country. We can either have wealth concentrated in the hands of the few or we can have democracy. So I think, I think that's a, a very pertinent issue for, for you know, democracy and, and my perspective. I think that the want for money is definitely based around culture. This Western culture has prioritized money over the ability to live your life and enjoy your life as you go along. I've always strived to do whatever I can to try and enjoy my career, enjoy what I'm doing, and not strive for that position in life. Um, because I think that that's what is culturally what everyone wants to achieve, but that's because everyone else wants to achieve it as well. And if, you're, if you focus more on the fact that you can take a step back and just enjoy life, and there are so many different other parts to it, um, I think that taking that step back can maybe achieve that. At the height of the uh, Euro crisis, Merkel said that um, Germany was convinced that Europe was its future and that if the Euro fails, Europe fails. Uh, this was a stark vision of how exactly Germany sees the role of money. Um, we've gone from 
a European Union founded in the 1950s on the basis of Christian Democrats, on the basis of solidarity, subsidiarity, morality, to a Europe whose entire future is bound up in a currency. That is an abject betrayal of what its origins were, and it's demonstrable of that problem, that we have come to abandon the other political values that we had in support of money. Until we can break that cycle, and the EU should be the one that takes the lead on it because it's the one who is most existentially threatened by this problem, it's unsolvable. We need Angela Merkel to be saying, Germany is convinced that Europe is its future, and solidarity, if solidarity fails, then Europe fails. I think that's the model for the future. Um, I think I would look at this perhaps from a perspective of, of different types of leadership. So if we look at perhaps the more traditional um, sort of transactional style of leadership, then money can you know, play a, a pivotal role in that in the sense that you are asking people to do a task for some kind of reward, in which case money would be you know, a sensible one to use. So as in, you know, in the, in the workplace, you have an employer getting you to do something. In return, you get a bonus, you get a financial reward, you get an in-paced, uh, in increased wages, sorry. Um, whereas actually, if we look at, you know, the more transformational style of leadership, actually, the kind of currency you're using isn't financial, it's not money. Actually, it's more looking at human emotion, morale, empathy, understanding the people you're working with. And actually, that doesn't necessarily require any, any money. It doesn't require you to use financial power um, to exert leadership or to develop leadership, actually, I don't think. So in, in one sense, it, money just becomes a resource if you're following that transactional style of leadership. But if you're looking for, at it from another perspective, I think actually money is actually relatively unimportant for me. Money, I think, is always going to be quite central to a lot of things. I mean, obviously, we need money to kind of um, make things happen in, in many ways. But I think, I mean, even just simple education schemes that were in the um, uh, one of the reports um, about buddying schemes and um, different ways to um, raise new leaders, simply using resources that are already in place. Um, and I think really focusing on... Um, yeah, morals and values um, to raise generations that then can use money wisely. I think um, it's got to start with with those that moral grounding, and then hopefully money is something that is naturally then handled um, in a way that can be more beneficial to society and um, to further field as well. So we've heard quite a lot about how money is used as a driver and its links with morality. Can I just very quickly sort of jump to Shreya and sort of say, in a decentralised world? Where do you see the role of finance? Do you, does, does the financial world dwarf government? How important is money in, in the world that you're entering? Very important, sadly. Um, I mean, we've seen, like, like you said, we've seen a decentralization of power sort of globally, uh, but we have also seen a centralization of power uh, across sort of class boundaries and across wealth boundaries. Uh, and to an extent, I think that that is always going to be there because you know, wealth buys influence and you, that you can't really get around that. The only thing we can do, I think, is um, as far as possible to try and sort of break that link between the wealthy and the whores of political power. Um, and so in, in a concrete sense, all we can do is ensure that we have stringent regulations in terms of awarding government contracts, lobbying, um, uh, campaign funding, that kind of thing, and ensure that all this is actually transparent and so that it's not covered under layers and layers of red tape and so that it's, um, it's, a, it's couched in a way that the average voter can understand. Uh, well, uh, can I talk to Ollie, actually? Just recently, you talked about Elon Musk. How important is money in the world? I was going to say, that for him, uh, very important. <laughs> um, so, uh, I think... Um, I think what's great about money is it can make the qualitative quantitative. Um, and I think what's great for particularly technology companies is that money is a marker of how successful they are. So I think that that's, I think, I, I mean, I would say the overall problem with money is that there's no, it is the benchmark of how successful you're doing, and especially, say, for growth. 
technology companies uh, kind of live or die by how much funding they raise, for example. So actually, as an indication of how well you're doing and the impact that you're making, I think um, it's really important. I think what's interesting is actually for technology companies, often the challenge with money is different. So one of Apple's biggest challenges is that their stock, cash stockpile is so big, they don't know what to do with it. Um, which is an interesting challenge to have because I wish I had it. Um, I think, um, I think uh, one figure I would point to that's, who's really interesting on the, um, the kind of role of money in society, who's also from a technology background, um, is a guy called Jack Ma, founder of Alibaba. Um, and so he runs, so Alibaba is bigger than uh, Amazon and eBay combined. Um, it's a massive company. Um, and he says that, um, if you, that the most difficult amount of money to have um, is over a billion. Um, the easiest amount of money to have is under a million, uh, which again, I wish I was, wish was true, but you know. Um, but, he, but he says that you know, the more money you have, it, the less it becomes yours, the more it becomes society's, because it's about your decision uh, in terms of what you do and what areas of society you support. Um, and he has a really, really interesting approach, which is actually, it's about supporting the things you believe in and so on. And I think it's about one of the challenges, how do you kind of get that uh, kind of mentality across into other areas? I think in America, for example, there's a great tradition of making a lot of money and then giving it all away. I think the more that those sorts of kind of initiatives can be instilled, um, the kind of the better, really. Uh, I think we've talked a, a lot about uh, the private use of money in business and finance, but I think we also should reconsider the public use of money. For example, in defense, I think that's, that's a global question to ask about how do we spend money publicly and is it a democratic way of spending money? Good to see the OTC riling that. But um, any other questions from the floor? Um, we heard... Uh at least part of the panel had the opportunity uh, of being having a mentor to sort of guide and direct them. Um, that mentor, no doubt, projected a particular style of leadership, uh, which was perhaps uh, at least one, if not several generations from their own. I wonder whether the panel thought that is the style of leadership I want to follow or whether it needs to be adapted in today's world. Um, I was not one of those uh, fortunate to have a mentor in this respect, uh, so I'm not sure if I'm the best person to answer this. Um, in a slightly broader sense, I don't think there's anything wrong in looking to examples of those from a slightly earlier generation as the leadership style. I think what I admire in, um, in, in those who are current leaders or past leaders, I think... I would try and replicate myself. Um, and where I would do things differently, I don't think I'd be at all concerned by this. I don't, think, I don't think being shown a model means that you necessarily adopt that model. I think it means that you try and take the very best of it and then adapt it to the world you inhabit at the time. Ollie, what are the things you would adapt? I, I think what's incredible is I've been l really lucky to have a number of kind of not official mentors, but people I've really looked up to and respected in uh, where I've worked. And I think what, what I found really interesting was how transferable those things are. Um, and so I used to work in advertising. There was this guy who was like loved brands. So he was like incredible brand, like designer, kind of planner. And I was like, the way that he does it is very backwards because he's talking about TV ads and he never mentions Twitter. Uh, but I, th I thought what was amazing about him was that he had a real belief in what he did. He had a sense of value. He had a sense of instilling that value and vision within other people. You know, these aren't, these aren't kind of principles that change, I don't think, with, with the times. These are really fundamental things. And I think, you know, leadership style and his quirks and, you know, whatever, do I would maybe not, not kind of follow. But his, his fundamental guiding principles, I think that's something great that a mentor can really instill in you, why you're doing it, purpose, and, and all of those sorts of things. Um, I worked uh, with a senior panelist um, at the King's um, panel, and um, uh, his name is um, Sir Nigel, uh, Nigel Scheinwald, and uh, he's been for most of his life in the um, uh, British uh, diplomatic service. Um, I think uh, the way in which he might have impacted my vision, my vision of leadership is that I, I can see now that leadership is should be should be um, understood in a, in broader terms than what we usually um, conceptualize 
Um, I think you can be a leader by negotiation and by cooperation and not, not just a leader by imposing or enforcing a way. So for our panel, we worked with Nick Kitchen at LSE Ideas, and we thought of him less as a mentor and more as a sort of spirit guide. <laughs> um, he, he was very, very hands off, uh, but I think that was actually <laughs> I think that was actually pretty great because he sort of gave us some very, very loose parameters and then allowed us to to run with it and to basically um, grow the project as as we saw fit, uh, which I think was great because. Uh, it, was, it wasn't patronizing in the way that sometimes people can unintentionally be. He sort of gave us respect and, um, yeah, allowed us to basically find ourselves and, and have faith in ourselves to produce the project. So I would say that that aspect of leadership is, is really key in allowing people to find their own skills and find their own feet without sort of holding their hand too much. Okay, so I think everybody on this panel is about the early 20s sort of age. That's roughly where everybody is. Roughly. Um, and I think we are all very caught in a very competitive environment right now. We are all mostly coming out of university, beginning to look for jobs and going through that process, which is incredibly competitive, sometimes quite challenging and for obvious reasons, very selective. So being able to have a mentor throughout this process and then in other walks of life as well has been such a fantastic experience in terms of just having somebody there, even to just tell you that you're doing the right thing, just to give you a thumbs up and, and give you that, that idea that you're on the right path, even if they're not telling you what to do and they're not directly, um, I mean, with, uh, we're lucky enough to have Edwina Morton, who was our mentor here today. She met with us and discussed our ideas and then backed off, let us write a report and then came back and, and looked at what we'd written. She didn't tell us what to write, but she helped us just make sure that we were along the right path and, um, that's something I value so much throughout this project and continue to value and hope to, in the years to come, go back and do the same thing for people who are in my position right now. And I would imagine that everybody here would do the same thing too. Um, Georgia, what are the things that you would want to adapt from, from older models of leadership, you know, from what you've seen? What are the things that you hope to take on, but what are the things that you sort of think wouldn't apply to your generation or need to be changed? Um, I think... I think what's really changed is probably the pace that things are changing. I think, um, especially with um, technology advancing, I think everything's become very dynamic. Um, so I think perhaps, um, I think instead of having the, uh, a kind of a model of leadership that is is kind of quite strategic in terms of these are the different steps um, of which you go, it's much more um, now got to be centred on um, core kind of morals and beliefs that actually you can take with you along that kind of journey of everything moving very fast and being quite unpredictable as well? Um, I think, actually, there is nothing in leadership that has become irrelevant or that no longer applies. Um, I think, if anything, sometimes looking back, like we, we have done particularly through this programme, at sort of the sort of leadership styles and behaviours that Churchill, for example, would display are still relevant in today's world and can still be applied quite quite easily. I think actually it's just a case of considering there are now different situations in which leadership needs to be applied and sometimes that kind of more dictatorial, authoritarian style of leadership works less well in today's society. However, I think there are still situations where that is useful and can be applied and can actually be subtly changed and applied in ways that are still effective. To make a, a slightly broader point, new isn't necessarily better. And just because there is something new doesn't mean that the old thing has gone away. Um, yeah, Ollie and James, that end of the table, are, are looking at cutting edge science and technology things. I'm not, but what I would say is we can be kind of a bit blinded by the fact there's all this new stuff and we can assume that therefore that is going to completely define the future. In the 1960s and 1970s, I don't think you would have found many sociologists who would have thought that you would have two th theology students on this panel. We're still here. Uh, religion is still here. History is still relevant and matters. Things take a very, very long time to actually change. And we can be guilty of thinking we've got something new, therefore we can ignore 
the old. The CIA rejected the opportunity to investigate religious leaders in Iran in the early 1970s because they thought it was useless sociology. They were wrong. There was a revolution. Uh, we need to be careful about thinking just because we've seen a new thing, that means the old thing doesn't count anymore. I think hindsight is um, a brilliant thing when it comes to leadership because you can look over history and you can see so many different leaders, um, examples of leadership throughout history. Um, quite a few have been mentioned already. But we have the advantage of being able to pick and choose what is most appropriate to us right now. And I think that's a very important consideration. I, I think we have to be careful. Here, we, we, we talk about this deficit of leadership, right? This, this, this deficit of statesmanship or whatever you want to call it. Um, but for me, what's equally important isn't, isn't so much the, the, the kind of leaders that are out there right now or in the past, because we've talked about uh, you know, Elon Musk or, or even people like uh, uh, Malala Yousaf or, or uh, Nelson Mandela going back a little bit further. Uh, there's, there's great leaders that are out there. Uh, for me, one of the fundamental problems is the type of institutions that we have and what kind of incentives they have for producing leaders, right? So, so a lot of people, you know, talk, like kind of, kind of uh, decry like the echo chambers and the populism of, of uh, Jeremy Corbyn or Bernie Sanders or Alexis Tsipras uh, down, in, down in Greece, Pablo Iglesias in, in Spain. Uh, and, and a lot of that criticism is, is, is fair, I think. But I think there's an equal argument to be made for, for the echo chambers that exist in more traditional establishment politicians like, like the, the uh, Hillary Clinton camp or, or Jeb Bush or David Cameron. There's, there's something about our institutions that produces these kinds of leaders that have the incentives to create echo chambers around them. And I, I think more than anything, what we have to do is create an environment in our political institutions that, that incentivizes and allows for deliberation and, and conversation across these varying ideologies rather than kind of this aggregative voting uh, uh, system that we have right now that, that encourages this, this partisan, partisan divide and these echo chambers that we're talking about uh, in the last panel and, and in the technology uh, uh, panel. And, and I think that's where our focus has to be. Just hang on to the mic for yeah. a second. Um, I thought what Georgia said was very interesting, that in because of technology and the, the pace it's going at now, it's very hard for leaders to be strategic mm -hmm. in the way that Winston Churchill would have been. It's very hard to sort of apply a big strategy or constantly reacting instead. Um, from your experience of sort of democracy in the digital world, is that is that something you would agree with? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, uh, technology, it's, it's disrupting the, the traditional ways of, of doing politics. You see that with, um, with the ability of, of people to organize and, and things, you know, some of the, some of the new movements that a lot of young people are, have been involved with, Occupy Wall Street, Indignados in Spain. Uh, a, a, lot of, a lot of these movements have, have a sort of core technological element to them that is disrupting the way that leadership is, is forming and, and you look at a, a lot of the media I think has has trouble with some of these movements and, and they are with with Black Lives Matter in the United States right now because a lot of these movements don't have centralized leaders that they can point to and say this is the person that you know is, is leading the charge of Black Lives Matter because that it, it just doesn't exist. It's a it's a more decentralized movement. And I think part of that is because of technology and the ability of everyone to participate in these sorts of movements from their own, their own spheres. So, so yeah, I absolutely think it's, it's pivotal in kind of understanding the new generation. around ideas rather than people. Yeah. Um, Ollie, you're bound to have something to say about strategy. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so, is, it, is uh, it impossible to be strategic in well, a Well, I think, a I kind of feel like people are using, uh, kind of using strategy and reaction interchangeably. Like, I, I, I don't. I think it's very easy to be strategic these days, uh, even with the pace of kind of communication and social media. The reason is because I think just because you can't broadcast, it doesn't mean that you can have a very strong message that is then replicated across uh, lots of different platforms. And I think um, so. Actually, a lot of the work we do is around like story storytelling and technology, because this whole idea like the medium is the, is the message. So actually, does your does your message get completely changed depending on the channel that you use? And I think that. Actually, it does, but if you consider that before you launch the campaign, then it's fine. 
Um, and I think you, you can look at some really, really good examples. So Nike Women Twitter, uh, check, check that out. An incredible uh, example of, again, not political strategy, um, but actually a brand telling a story in a very strategic, incredible way. And it's very reactive. So if you tweet at uh, uh, Nike Women tw Twitter and you go, oh, I, I didn't go to the gym today, I'm exhausted, they'll respond to you in a very kind of Nike, uh, kind of empowering, just do it way, despite the fact that it's incredibly reactive. So I think that actually in many of these cases, and particularly with political campaigns, to have a very strong sense of purpose and belief, and everyone understands that, but then is empowered in a kind of grassroots way that we've been talking about to adapt that message to different channels. That's a new way, I think, of, of thinking about a collaborative strategy that ensures that your message, the key message you want to get across, stays the same, but that the way that people are talking about it and the way that it's adapted um, is allowed some flex and, uh, and ability to change. So do you think it's just something we haven't learned to harness yet? Yeah, I think that everyone thinks strategy is slow. It's because, every, it's because it's in the same way that everyone, like in advertising, thought that it was all about broadcast. And then when it comes in, in, time, in, in kind of terms of co-creation, that's seen as, well, how can we be strategic with co-creation? I think it's just re realigning what you believe strategy to be and including uh, kind of co-creation and, and actually a two-way relationship between yourselves and the people that you're communicating with. Like with any sort of leadership, I think it's about you know, empowering other people and having a relationship rather than just standing at a podium, broadcasting the message that's going to be replicated in exactly the same way uh, wherever it is. Any other questions from the floor? I'm Andrew Hill. I'm the management editor of the Financial Times. I've done a some interviews with the next generation leaders that will appear in a feature in the FT magazine on Saturday. But one of the questions I, I didn't ask, which I'd like to ask the panel, uh, is about this question of mavericks versus conformists that Ruth Kelly uh, raised in the first panel. It is inevitable that people in their 20s are more likely to be guarding maverick ideals and ideas and then boom, they wake up at 50 as conformists. <laughs> what personal strategies do you have to prevent that happening to you? Um, I think, I mean, I know that my dad is always saying to me whenever I come home from uni and have all these amazing ideas and huge dreams of, of what I'm trying to achieve. And, and he just says, yeah, further down the line, you'll just realize that you've done one little tiny baby step of that. And actually you'll be pretty chill and happy that you've managed to achieve that. Um, I think I, I always kind of say back, actually, I think it's really important that you have people at kind of this age, especially having those big dreams. And I don't think that's naive. Um, I think for me, something that has been probably quite good to to help me keep more realistic um, about then how to make those steps um, is actually mentoring, going back to that. And um, that's been, been huge for me in, in various different levels and different um, areas of, of where I've invested my time. I've kind of had different mentors within that. Um, and I think that's been an important strategy to kind of, um, I guess, reap some wisdom from someone else um, and someone who's a little bit older um, and a little bit more experienced in that particular area. Um, and I think it's, it's been important for me to actually have be challenged as well and kind of um, be put in my place sometimes um, to have to then readjust um, the steps that I'm thinking I'm going to take. Um, so for me, it's probably mentoring has been quite important. Um, I, think, I think for me, what stands out um, personally, it's about it's about being uncomfortable. It's about being at the edge of your comfort zone actually forces you to constantly be creative and come up with new ideas and seek new ways forward. And I think perhaps the thing as, as you progress through life and you progress through your career, you get established in things and you get comfortable. And then there's less of an incentive to be a maverick and to think of new ways of approaching a problem completely because you're, you, know, you are successful, you're established, you're reaching the top of of your field and there is less requirement for you to do that in some senses. Um, so I think, yeah, the important thing for me is just actually personally not doing the same thing for too long and proactively putting myself in an uncomfortable situation where I will then be forced to adapt because actually then the onus isn't so much on me to try and change. Actually, the onus is on the situation that I'm in to force me to change, which actually makes things a bit simpler from my perspective. Ben, would you consider yourself a maverick? Absolutely. Um, I, I think more... We often, I think, mistake a maverick for a madman, or vice versa. 
you can create extremely radical change without being maverick about everything. Uh, I think the fascinating example of this at the moment is if you look at the differing way of press coverage of the Catholic Church since Pope Francis became Pope. Well, theologically, there's not a lot of difference between Benedict XVI and Francis. And yet the press coverage difference, and you can map it, is absolutely extraordinary. From overwhelmingly negative coverage of everything talked about with Catholicism to really quite the opposite. It seems like every week the Daily Mail has a picture of the Pope kissing a baby. Uh, and all the problems are still there. There's still the sex abuse scandal. There's still the Vatican Bank. And yet somehow, without being a madman, without being obsessed with being different on everything, you can create quite radical changes in perception in the way organizations are perceived as running. And the other thing I'd say very quickly is that also media is going to change this and social media is going to change this. The era of being able to assume authority and to assume that once you reached a position of leadership, that was fine, is over in an era when anyone is on the internet and everyone is on the internet. Uh, and you can see that with, in religious groups as well. There are whole new religions starting on Second Life. Do they count as real religions if no one's seen each other face to face? Do you, are you able to maintain canons if it's just kind of semi-fictional? I've really got no idea, but it's, dem it's demonstrable of the way in which authority is basically just going out of the window with these new structures. I suppose... Every person in this room has their own opinion on where they would define themselves as a maverick. Um, it's a very personal thing because if you wanted to change the world and to really, really go for it in completely the other way from conformism, um, you may want to just do t one tiny little step or you might want to completely go for it. Success towards that comes one step at a time, no matter what route you take towards it. Um, and I think in order to avoid conformism, um, you'd have to just continue doing what you believe in and what you love in order to reach that. I want to I reiterate something that, I'm sorry, remind me, that Ben said. Uh, I, I think the focus on, on being a maverick, it's, I, I don't think it's quite the right focus. I, I mean, I'm against the prohibition of murder. I think that's a, a pretty mainstream conformist position to have, and I'm okay with that. Like that's, I don't need to be a maverick on that issue. I, I think the, the, the focus should be on creative and, and good uh, policy ideas, in the realm of politics at least, um, for, for you know, these problems that we have. And I think, I think where that needs to come from is, and I, again, I'm kind of reiterating a point that I made earlier, is deliberation, right? And and for me, kind of maintaining that creativity, and maintaining um, uh, whatever you want to call it, those maverick ideas or or those those good ideas on those issues, uh, it comes down to not closing yourself off to opposing ideas, as uh, I think someone else said, and and maintaining lines of communication with people that disagree with you, that pe with people who have different values than you, um, because that is how we're going to move forward. As, as a society, I think, is through, through understanding. And, and we've seen with, with political experiments that have gone on in kind of deliberative politics and, and getting citizens together who have diverging viewpoints. We've, say, we've seen it in British Columbia with the Citizens' Assembly that went on there. We've, we've seen it in Northern Ireland in, in some, some experiments. We've, we've seen it all over the world that when you get people together and they have genuine conversations with each other, we can solve a lot of these issues in creative and, and collective ways. So on this side, so you should consider yourself a maverick and how do you prevent yourself from... <laughs> <laughs> Difficult question. Um, I would say it's not just about us. It's about the organisations and your generation as well as, as, well as our generation. Um, if we are a maverick in our personal life, um, I run a non-profit. That's my maverick element, my fixing the world element. Um, if I'm then forced to choose between my personal maverick and my professional conformism, organisations are making me pick between the two. If there is a way of integrating the two, I think that's the only way we can truly achieve more creativity within industries. It's happening in the tech industry particularly, but I don't feel like it's happening, especially in a lot of policy circles. Um, 
there are other places it needs to happen more. And that's not just about us, it's about um, everybody else who is currently in the field at the moment and your contribution to that as well. Yeah, I think my dad would be horrified that I'm being encouraged to be a maverick because I've definitely never had issues with that. Um, but I think, uh, reiterating what Emmeline said, and I think Ruth touched on this as well, uh, that it needs, we need creativity to be institutionally nurtured. So if I go into the FCO tomorrow for an interview, I'm not necessarily going to say, I think your so-and-so strategy is idiotic, even if I do. But obviously that might be helpful input for them. Uh, but I think, you know, given being a young person looking for a job, I'm not going to um, feel comfortable expressing these kinds of views when I have, you know, other... Uh, coming back to money, other very real-world issues to think about. So I think uh, that we do need to have some kind of safety net or some kind of encouragement that, yes, you can um, air your views and you can say things even if it doesn't necessarily conform with what the organisation thinks. Uh, I'm not sure how comfortable I am with the words maverick and um, conformist. I think people are sort of both ev every day. It really depends on, on, on what they choose to, to do and mainly if they, they just choose to do things out of belief rather than routine. Um, but I definitely think also that doing things out of belief is not enough. You need to let those beliefs be challenged by others. And if you strive towards that, you're definitely not going to, f to fall into either one of those boxes. Um, I feel like... Uh, uh I feel like where the question comes from also is that idea that everyone, lots of people who are old and conformists feel like when they were 20, they were mavericks. Um, and I'd maybe question that, I don't know. Uh, because I feel like uh, even the idea, I think I agree the definitional issue with being a maverick is, you know, belief or money, that seems to be it, you know. But if you actually look at Jeremy Corbyn or like Steve Jobs or, uh, you know, even some people, uh, you know, leading kind of very traditional businesses, you get actually very, and again, I don't think it's about being maverick. I think it's just about having actually ideas which put maybe something like belief or vision before what you would intuitively think it makes sense to do. So just one very quick example of a mainstream example of that is Unilever in 2012 published all of their biggest strategic challenges over the next five years. And any business book that you read in the last 100 years says, whatever you do, do not do that. Because P&G will just go, oh, great, thanks. And they also published all the research that they did in association with all of those challenges. That is a very maverick move. It doesn't make any sense. But actually, their argu strategic argument uh, was that all of the most innovative people in the world don't work for Unilever. So either they're going to compete with us or we can collaborate with them. Um, so I think that there are actually a lot of mainstream uh, different ways of thinking, different ways of doing business, different ways of conducting yourself that seem on the surface like insanity, but actually have very clear thinking and innovative thinking behind them. And I think really the message that I would give is don't be so quick to judge because actually many people who appear to be very conformist are actually the biggest mavericks, but they just do their ideas very well. Um, and actually people forget that there was the challenge of what they wanted to introduce because it's taken as read. For example, you know, when the iPad was first introduced, people were like, this is crazy. No, who would want it? And actually how quickly we have to forget those kind of uh, original maverick thoughts. Uh, as the last of 10 on this one, I think most of what I might have wanted to say has already been said, but I'll just highlight again this idea that I'm not really sure what a maverick is in this context, because especially in the sciences, what might be billed as maverick point of, points of view are still essentially logical progressions based on evidence. But the thing is, it's also based on where you're coming from, what your previous experiences are, you know, um, what you already know and don't know and so it might be a logical progression, but it's not one that someone else would make. And so I think I agree with, with much, as what, much of what has been said in that to potentially be a maverick, although I'm not, potential, not sure what we all agree by that term, you really need to keep taking yourself out of your comfort zone. You need to talk to others who either disagree with you or have different values, who are simply doing very different things from you. The same topic or area or point of discussion can look exceptionally different in two different languages or from two different points of view. Um, but I think all of, those, uh, all of those mixtures mean that you really want people, in order to, to foster this creative thinking, you want people who are just comfortable enough to know that they can cope outside of their comfort zone, but not so uncomfortable that they won't go there. And in the sciences, at least, some of the most 
um, impressive and successful scientists are those who every seven or eight years have entirely changed fields. And they have done some really fantastic things. And arguably, by staying put in one area in any walk of life, really, I don't think that, that comes about in the same way. Okay. I think that's probably it for now. Thank you very much to everyone who had a question. Thank you very much to the panelists. Man, Manveen, guys, uh, thank you very much. I promise you one thing. We are going to push the comfort zone. That's, that's what we're about. If, if I look at a, any 21st century organization now, I'm asking myself, what's the two-way mentoring? You have just given us an, an expert view um, and encouragement on the whole of that process. And I really look forward to brainstorming with you guys on how we can take forward the next stage. Thank you very much.